Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before thee. We thank you for this far you have brought us. You have kept us safe throughout the day and gathered us here for your name's sake. You have said when two or three are gathered in your name, you shall be in our midst. So this evening we ask for your illumination. Speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, teach us, O oh my Father, and encourage us that we may have faith and obedience for your service. Use me, O oh God, as a vessel, and ask this all to the glory of your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We may have our seats. Don't you worry. God is in the midst of us this evening. It's nice to see you. Good evening, everyone. Praise be to God. My name is Evangelist Nira. I am saved and Christ is my Lord. I want to thank um, first and foremost our God and Savior that for his masses for this day just to bring me here. And again, I want to thank the vicar and his team for the opportunity that they have given me to share the word with you this evening. As I've said, my name is Nira, and uh, this evening our sermon is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 18, verses 1 to 17. We shall look at verses 1 to 17, and I've titled it, Called to Make Disciples. Our mission is we are called as believers to make disciples, and under the series, called wholeheartedly for God. Amen? So as Reverend Luciana has read, I will look at chapter 18 from verses 1 to 8. We read here, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who had heard him believed and were baptized. So we see church. Corinth was one of the wealthiest cities of the Roman Empire. We are told it was a political and commercial center of Greece and surpassing Athens in importance. It had a reputation for great wickedness and immorality, common in many large cities today. It was a trade center. And so we see there was greed for material gains and sensual lust plagued the Corinthians. There were several temples of various gods throughout the city and a temple of the goddess Aphrodite had been built on a large hill behind the city. And we are told she was the goddess of sexual love, of beauty, and of war. So there were several other buildings around that temple. And those buildings, we were told, were of male and female prostitutes. So because it was a trade center, many travelers would come. They would come and... Um, pay money to have these male and female prostitutes who served in religious rituals. So in Corinth, we're told there was a lot of filth going on. 
because it was a cosmopolitan city. It had all sorts of people, people from all over the world who traveled to do business. And it was so notorious that when one said to Corinthianize, it meant to practice all forms of depravity. So Apostle Paul found Corinth a very great challenge and a ministry opportunity for him to point the lost to Christ. And when you read, later on he would write a series of letters to the Corinthians, the first and second letter of Corinth, dealing in part with the problems of immorality. So in Corinth, we find, as we have read from verses 1 to 8, Paul, Apostle Paul, found companions. He found a place to sleep and a place to work. And he had two friends. Paul found companions in Corinth. He found a lodging, work, and friendship with a couple. It was, they were a Jewish couple, Aquila and Priscilla, who had fled to Corinth from Roman because the government there, the governor there, we are told, was persecuting Jews. So they had fled from a Roman go governor who was persecuting Jews against the Jews in Italy. They were living in Italy and they fled to Corinth. Through Paul, the two believed in the Lord and they became his ministry partners, even risking their lives for Paul. So through Paul's ministry, Aquila and Priscilla believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and they became ministry partners. And we see that still in Corinth, Paul's ministry in the synagogue, as we have read. He preached in the synagogue that Jesus is the promised Messiah. In verses 5, we're told Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Then he persevered until opposition arised. The Jews went against him and they became hostile. When Paul realized there was no more he could do, he shook the dust from his clothes and he said, your blood is upon your heads. I'm innocent. We're told it is a Jewish cultural expression to show he was clean from responsibility for them because they had rejected Jesus as a Messiah. So he told them he would go to the Gentiles who would be more receptive. And this we see in verse 6. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Meanwhile, while this was happening, two of his um, disciples, Timothy and Silas, had arrived with good news that Paul's beloved converts in Thessalonica and Berea were physically safe and growing in spiritual maturity. And so they came to Paul with a gift from the Thessalonians. Again, at the same time, we see ministry in Titus Justice Home. We are told he was a Gentile who lived next to the synagogue in verses 8. He worshipped God and he opened his home to all who wanted to learn more about Jesus through Paul. So Paul would use the home of justice Titus to preach to the Gentiles. And we are told again that Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the name of the Lord so now a new church gathered, and many Corinthians believed and were baptized. Through Paul's initiatives, through Paul's discipline, many Corinthians came to believe God. But at the same time, when you look at the other verses, violent persecution still arose. However, this time, when we read in verses 9 and 10, God ruled differently. The Lord Jesus Christ personally encouraged Paul in a vision to persevere without fear or harm. Without fear of harm. Our focus verse is verses 9 and 10. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. 
Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So our focus verse is verse 9, where Jesus Christ personally encouraged Paul in a vision to persevere without fear of harm. And so we're looking at verses 9, and to our first point, we see Jesus' authority. Verse 9, Jesus' authority. Don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. No matter the persecution, no matter opposition, Paul, keep on speaking. So Jesus here was speaking to Paul, and he's speaking to you and me today. Because as believers, as disciples of Christ, we are out to speak about the gospel of good news. Jesus holds all authority. He has the right to delegate authority as he wills. Jesus' supreme authority means that he will supply believers with everything required to navigate life in a fallen world. He will help you, he will give you strength, he will give you wisdom, he will equip you to share the gospel and even give you hope to anticipate eternity. We should not be afraid, we should not keep silent. The lifelong pursuit God intends for his children is to pour into others and point them to Christ. So the church has one key mission to make disciples. We are to make disciples. We are to be fishers of men. Believers are called to spread the gospel. And our mission should extend around the entire globe. We should evangelize and nurture believers to maturity. The idea is to share the gospel and build into others so that they love and follow Christ. Believers are to seek people from all walks of life to come to Christ. What does this imply? This implies that our intentions should be outward focused action. As we are here in the church, we should always think of how we will reach out to others. So an intentional outward focused action. As God's people, we are called from our homes and our churches to go into our neighborhoods, our cities, our, our countries, and to the world. That was a great commission in the book of Acts, or in the book also of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 20, where Jesus told his disciples to go out and preach the gospel. In the book of Acts, he talks about where they would start from Jerusalem to Judea and to the outside world. So in the midst of our busy schedules, and I believe we are all busy people, we have a lot to do, as God's people, we should intentionally set our gaze and direct our steps towards people who need Jesus. And there are many out there who need Jesus, who do not know about the good news of God. I know many a times we all tend to come to church, listen to the word, be strengthened, be encouraged, gain hope once again, and leave. But I have, as I have said, our intentions should be outward focus. We should reach out to others, those who cannot come to church. I know to lie at Jesus' feet is to be blessed. As you're seated there and we're listening to him and learning from him is to be blessed. But when we stay here, we miss the point of the resurrection. It's a gift to all. It's a gift to all. So a Christian's goal is not to merely survive life in this world until called to heaven. Mm -mm. Instead, we are to invest our years on this earth to influence more people to turn to Jesus for salvation and walk faithfully with him. So Paul saw an opportunity in Corinth. How about us? When opportunities do come our way, 
do we take up the challenge? Paul saw the challenge in Corinth and embraced it. When the Jews opposed him, he decided he would go to the Gentiles. He was, deve he was devoted, we see, and lost souls were saved. We were told the new church started gathering there, and many Corinthians believed and were baptized. To our second point, disciple-making is Jesus' assignment. Verses 10, it is Jesus' assignment. It is not our assignment. The authority, we've seen the authority is Jesus' authority, and now we're seeing it is Jesus' assignment. For I am with you, in verses 10, he says, and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. Despite the city being full of filth, Jesus appears to Paul in a vision and he says, many people in this city belong to me because where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And so we might look at ourselves and find ourselves weak but believers, brothers and sisters, it is not by power, it is not by might, but by God's spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that, that will lead us and guide us, that will strengthen us and encourage us. So on the basis of his unlimited authority, Jesus called his followers to a grand mission. And we must obey. Obedience does not require complete understanding but rather rises from expectant faith and humble surrender. We see here in Corinth, Apostle Paul obeyed. When Christ appeared to him in that vision, he obeyed and he stayed in Corinth. Verses 11 says, So Paul stayed for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. We must comply with Jesus' instruction. He is the assignment, we are the assignees. As believers, as Christians, he is sending us out, just the way he sent Paul out to Corinth. God's plan is to restore and redeem sinful humanity. God is above us in every way, yet stoops to love and communicate with us. So a key mission here is to bring people to Christ, to nurture them to maturity. We see here God spoke to Paul. And we know what happened, who Paul was before he became Paul. He was Saul, and at Damascus he met Christ in a vision, and he became Paul. He persecuted the church. He was amongst those who persecuted the church. But in Acts 9, when he changed, he pointed people to Christ. This was his second missionary journey, by the way. And he continued in a third missionary journey. It was towards the end of his second missionary journey when he went to Corinth. To our third point, we see Jesus' presence, verses 10. For I am with you, and no one will attack and harm you. So as we minister to others, as we disciple others, the very presence of Jesus goes with his children as they obey his commands. He has delegated his authority and promised his presence to every believer. He, Jesus himself, remains with his children always. As he says, he will never leave us nor forsake us. Our failures, our weaknesses, our neediness do not drive him away, but rather draw him near. So verses 12 we see the Jews tried to bring a court case against Paul, accusing him of preaching a new religion which was forbidden under the Roman laws. Galileo was the proconsul then, so Galileo the proconsul of Corinth abruptly dismissed the case as you read from verses 12 to verses 17. And it says, while Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. 
Just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to the Jews, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he had them ejected from the court. Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court. But Galileo showed no concern whatsoever. So seeing Galileo's indifference, we see the Corinthian crowds vented their own hatred to the Jews by beating Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler. While they were trying to put Paul into prison, confusion got into the camp. God fought for Paul personally. Jesus fought that battle. So we see here blessings were part of a surprising chain of events in Paul's life. Paul stayed a considerable time longer in Corinth. He became devoted to the Corinthians. He longed for their full freedom from idolatry, immoral habits, from their filth, from their gods and goddesses. And we see the Corinthian church grew. And true to the word, they used to call it the classical Pauline con congregation. As believers, it is right to be concerned about those who have never heard the gospel. Because the reason Christ empowers believers to reach the world with the good news of salvation. You are not of your own. Jesus is with you. His presence with, is with you. He will give you the words. He will equip you. He will guide you. He will fight the battles for you. We should not be discouraged. The God we serve, when you're down at the valley, is the same God. And when you're on top of the mountain, he's the same God. His presence will go with you. God our Father is always present and doing what is best for all his children. So a key mission, as from the passage this evening, is to go out and make disciples of man is to go out and be fishers of man. We should just not sit on what we know, but share it with others and point them to Christ. We bring lost souls to church. There are many out there who do not know. There are many out there who suffer. We learn every other Sunday when we come here and we sit at his feet. Paul listened and obeyed and he remained in Corinth, the most filthiest city and most of the world cities are of the same filth. Especially when a city is cosmopolitan, where people are from different backgrounds. We find evil and wickedness is there. As believers, we should not give up. The authority is Jesus. The assignment is from Jesus, and his presence is with us. In conclusion, we have learned that the church has one key mission, is to make disciples Believers are called to spread the gospel. Jesus authorizes us. He assigns us. His presence is with us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is good to know that it is your plan for the gospel of good news to reach the lost. Because it is you who authorizes, fill us with your strength, power, and wisdom to accomplish that which you have started. Equip us, guide us, and lead us where the harvest is plenty. Use us, O oh my Father, as vessels. Like the Apostle Paul, help us to recognize opportunities and take action. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And we all say... Amen. Thank you.